Well, guys, it's good to see you here this morning. I usually get to talk to you for about two minutes. So there's a bunch of stuff I wanted to tell you. We're going to be here till about three this afternoon. Uh, no, that's not true. Hey, it is, it is great to, uh, to be with you. And uh, let me just add um, uh, my personal uh, thoughts just about it. it's, it's tough with what's going on with Jim and Don. Um, losing Don and, and, um, and Jim going through what he's going through. And I, I'd just like to ask you not only to pray for uh, those guys and their families, but, you know, pray for their table, too. I know those guys are, are hurting, too, and, and uh, we're, we're standing with you guys um, through this. So, Well, uh, I don't know if anybody's been watching the news lately, but it doesn't seem like things are going all that well. And, uh, and so I thought this morning, as we uh, took some time away from uh, the series that's going on, that, that, that we would talk about uh, crisis. And so our topic today is going to be uh, learning to live in the unshakable kingdom. And we're going to look at some passages in Hebrews 12. I don't know uh, if you caught, have you caught all the news, though. There are several companies that, in light of the economic hardships, have decided to change their logos uh, Dow Jones is now Down Jones. Zero. Kind of, they need some toner, obviously. Uh, Apple's got a few more bites out of it. Didn't really have to say anything, did I? Uh. <laughs> and yeah. They didn't like this one when I showed it in Detroit. They thought, I don't know what it was, but some guys got up and walked out, and I don't know what it was. All right, but we're going to talk about crisis, talking about crisis. Now, uh, besides the obvious economic crisis, what kinds of crisis do you see uh, guys go through in their lives? Marriage. Marriage crisis. Good. What else? Spiritual, Spiritual crisis. What? Job, Job crisis. Health crisis. That pretty much is. That's like a whole man's life right there, isn't it? We, well, we forgot one. Kid, kid crisis. How many of you have had a kid crisis? Yeah. Uh, my daughter's a teenager. It's like one after another, you know? But uh, uh, so, so we all live in crisis. But this, this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about learning to live in the unshakable kingdom. We're going to start with how does crisis affect men? Then we'll... We'll talk about why did crisis even happen, and then how should we respond to crisis. Now, this is a total aside here. What's the plural for crisis? Like, it's probably crises, but that's like a weird word to say. So I'm just going to say crisis, okay? And you'll just have to figure out if I mean one or a million of them. But we're just going to use the word crisis. It ends with an S, so we'll just, we'll just go with that. So, uh, so here's my paradigm for this morning. I'm, you've all seen the, uh, the Homeland uh, Security Advisory System, and you know if it's, you, and we, if any of you that travel, you hear this all the time, right? If, I think we're on orange right now. We have a high risk of terrorist attacks, or if it's yellow, we have a significant risk of terrorist attacks. And I got to thinking, as I was thinking about crisis this week, that, you know, there's sort of a, a need for a manhood crisis advisory system. And that each of us probably lives our lives somewhere on this manhood crisis advisory system scale. So if everything is going wrong in your life, that's sort of that red, severe thing. You know, you got your, 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 maybe you lost your job and your, and your wife's, you know, really unhappy about you losing your job and, and you're having problems with your kids and, and, uh, you know, and, and um, now you can't pay your bills. So you've got a financial crisis going on. You know, you're in a severe, you're in a severe crisis. Or, or maybe you've just got sort of one thing going really bad. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a health crisis in your family or, or in your own life. And so you're, you're feeling pretty overwhelmed. You're suffering, you feel like. Um, and so you need somebody to pray for you a lot. Uh, or maybe you're sort of elevated. I think most guys probably live in this yellow elevated crisis level that you're just, you're sort of waiting for something to go wrong. Anybody there with me? You know, uh, you know, try, try working for an organization that lives on donations right now. You know, it's sort of, an, sort of a yellow crisis level at times around the office. Everything's okay, but you're sort of looking over your shoulder a little bit, making sure everything's going to be okay. 
And then, you know, we kind of like to live in this blue, probably guarded place. You know, things are good. Um, there's some risks here and there, you know, and, and this is a place that's, that's easy to take risks from. And then green, which is low, everything is awesome. You just got a, a, a 100% increase in pay, and uh, you're like 25 years old, and your wife is gorgeous, and you have no kids yet, and <laughs> your parents are rich, they don't need any help. You know, uh, you know, that's low. All I have to say with you, if you're in the green right now, the rest of us are really ticked off at you. So, because it's, it's just not fair. So, so we sort of all live probably in, um, in a state of, uh, in, some, in some level of this crisis advisory system as men. Well, you know, right now, a lot of guys are going through significant crisis. And um, I went, you know, Pat talks about his crisis in the 80s. Well, I, I went through, you know, the 80s, we had the last uh, real estate uh, bust with the changing of the tax laws. But, you know, there's been, a, there's been a more recent economic meltdown, and I lived through that one, and that was the dot-com, when the dot-com bubble burst. And uh, so I thought I'd just take a, a couple minutes this morning and tell you a little bit about that. This is my family. Uh, that's my wife on the right side of the picture on the bottom, just to be clear. Uh, and uh, my daughter is on the left hanging off a wall. Uh, she loves to do that. And then that's my son. That's a couple years old. That's uh, on a river that, that that white water, that dangerous white water you see, was about the eight feet of white water in this whole river. Uh, and they just knew where to take the picture. You know what I mean? Uh, I love this picture. It's the picture that I have of my son at his happiest. That's the happiest picture I have of my son. Uh, my son's sort of a contemplative, kind of introspective kind of kid, and so I don't get to see him. He does, he's not a kid given to wild abandon, um, but that's the happiest picture I have. I have about five pictures of us on the river, and they all have one thing in common. His oar is not in the water in any of them. <laughs> all right? Dad's doing all the work, and uh, so that's, a, that's probably a story for another time. But this is my family. This is my family. And I almost this close to not having these pictures to show you. That picture on the bottom right, we're sitting at my son's Little League game about a year ago. Um, and I almost didn't have these pictures to show you. Back in the late 90s, uh, I, was, I helped a, a, fr- a few of my friends and I started a software company in Orlando. And um, we were excited. We ori- originally started it as a part of a nonprofit effort in, in, in the city to connect the homeless agencies together here. And that in- eventually grew uh, other communities were expressing an interest, and so we actually got some investors and bought the software away from the nonprofit sector and started a for-profit company to market the software. And, and in 1999, we did a million dollars worth of business with six people in the company. We had one salesman. Now, how do you sell a million dollars worth of stuff with one salesman? Well, first of all, you price it right, let me tell you, you know. Uh, if you price it big enough, you don't have to make that many sales uh, to get to that number. Um, but, you know, here's how I did it. Um, I would get on a plane any time to go anywhere to talk to anybody about this software package that we had, about the system that we had. And in my head, as I'm going here and going there, I'm telling myself the story over and over again. I'm doing this for my family. I'm doing this for my family. I wanted to get in on the ground floor of a software company every week or every month, you'd see a a new magazine come out, like an Inc. magazine or a success magazine, and on the cover would be a guy about my age, a very rich guy about my age, who had started a computer company, a software company. And so I thought, I'm going to be that guy, and I'm going to provide everything that my family needs. And so I would go, I would just get on a plane and go. And, uh, we came into 2000, and um, we, the venture capitalists got involved. Any venture capitalists in the room? Okay, good. The vulture capitalists got involved. <laughs> and uh, they said, hey, you need to grow the company. And so we grew the company from six to 35 employees, brought in some new investors. We, get, we brought in the three Fs, friends, family, fools, to invest in the company. And, uh, and then what we, couldn't, what we couldn't raise in investment, we borrowed. And, uh, but we were going like gangbusters. Now I had six salespeople working with me who knew 
nothing about the software. So basically, I had six appointment setters for me, and so I was traveling even more. And so one day, one of my guys called me up from Texas, and he said, Brett, you got to get out here. There's this statewide system. That, we didn't have anything nearly that big. We had some countywide systems, but nothing statewide. So there's this statewide system. They put it out for bid. Nobody's responsive. So now they just get to pick a vendor. We don't have to go through the bidding process. But man, you've got to get here. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The meeting's the day after tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning. You've got to get here tomorrow so we can get ready for this meeting. So I sort of, I was excited. I was excited, you know. So I called my wife up. And I said, honey, I'm really sorry. I know I've been traveling a lot. And then I started telling her about the deal. You know, like she's going to really be excited about the state of Texas while she's got, you know, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, one on each ankle, you know, asking her for stuff because dad's, because she's talking to me on the phone. And... Um, she said uh, a sentence that changed my life. She said, that's okay. It's easier when you're not here. And I thought, I don't think that the that's okay is really true. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's what she's saying to me. Um, so I did, you know, what every fine, upstanding Christian man would do. Yeah, I went on the trip. Um, <laughs> Now, understand that I was, a, I was a believer. I was in church every weekend. I might travel all week, but man, I made sure I was home on the weekends so that I could be in church with my family on Sunday. Because you know why? Because I wanted to look good. And uh, we were involved in, in children's ministry, and so I was up there singing songs and doing hand motions and, you know, all the stuff on the weekends. And then, man, right on Monday morning, I'd be right out the door again, off into the battle, you know? And... Um, so I thought, you know, there might be a problem here. Well, about that time, another problem hit. The bubble burst. And so I had this issue at home. I had this company that was leveraged to the hilt. The, all the venture capitalists went up in smoke when the bubble burst in the tech market. And um, I didn't know what to do. And I got a phone call from a buddy of mine whose wife was in a Bible study with my wife. And he said, hey, hey, you know, our wives are in that Bible study. I was thinking maybe we should get the guys, the husbands together and have our own Bible study because, like, for, if for no other reason than just to protect ourselves because I'm pretty sure they're talking about us. <laughs> and I knew they were because I'd heard stories about them. But um, I said, that's great. What do you want? Okay, you know, I've been in church my whole life. I knew what to say. I knew what to do. I said, great, that's great. You know, what are we going to study? He said, I don't know, they gave some book out in church. Just find that book and bring it. We're going to meet on Tuesday night. So I'm like, all right, I'm in town this week. So I go and I look through the shelf and I pull this book out. I blow the dust off the cover, right? And what's the book? The Man in the Mirror, right? They'd given it away in my church a few weeks before. And so I sort of dusted it off and I, and I went to this group and, and, um, and an interesting thing started to happen. I, I like started to read the Bible again. I started to pray again. I started to be with these guys. You know, it took us a couple weeks to get past the sort of spiritual niceness that we do when we're Christian guys and we get together and actually start cussing and spitting and all that stuff at each other and calling each other out on things and being straightforward. And that was awesome. And one day, I, I had no idea how this uh, was affecting my life until one day I called my wife and on a Tuesday night, a few weeks later, you know, things are really going downhill. And I called my wife and I said, honey, I'm not going to go to group tonight. I just want to come home and be with you. And this is what I heard. Are you kidding? Do you know how much better husband you've been since you've been going to that group? Don't come home. Go to that group or do, just don't come home. So I, so I stood up for my rights as the man of the house and said, why don't you tell me what to do? I'm going to go to my group tonight. And, and I went. And so, in the meantime, the, the economy is just in the tank. My part of it. My part of the economy was in the tank. A lot of people were doing great, but my part of the economy was in the tank. We grew from five or six to 35 employees, and in one day, we, we uh, grew right back down to like eight again. That was a, that was a tough day. And I, and I lived about six months of my life in this crisis mode where I was trying to balance the fact that things were horrible at work and yet I had, I had this 
this foundation in my life, a newfound foundation in my life that was giving me something firm to stand on so that I could weather the storm. And what God was doing through that experience is he was saying to me, there are things in your life that are shakable. There are things in your life that are unstable. There are things in your life that you can't rely on. But I'm going to give you something that you can rely on. And what he gave me that I could rely on was my faith, God's word, my brothers, and eventually my marriage. We had a lot of stuff to work through, trust me. And it's because, frankly, of that crisis in my life that I have these pictures to show for you. Do you know the worst thing that could have happened to me? The market didn't tank. All the venture capitals gave us all the money they promised us. Our company became super successful. Oh, yeah, I'd be on the cover of a magazine, maybe, by myself. All by myself. And I wouldn't have any of these pictures to show. God came into my life and removed these things that could be shaken and gave me a foundation, a strong foundation to stand on. So let's look at how this can happen in our lives. So first of all, we're going to talk about how how crisis affects men, how crisis affects men. And let's look, we're going to look real quickly, we're going to scan through the Bible with some characters to see how they handled crisis. In Genesis 3, we see Adam. Adam and Eve are standing in the garden. Uh, A serpent comes and engages Eve in a conversation. Adam stands there and watches the whole thing. He's there the whole time. You realize that? She took the apple, shook the fruit, took a bite of it, and gave it to Adam, who was with her. And he eats it. And then uh, God comes. And Adam steps out into the path of God and says, Oh Lord, I really messed up. Please forgive me. Right? Unfortunately, no. What does Adam do? He does what a lot of men do. He runs and he hides. He isolates himself. When he finally, he withdraws. A lot of guys do that, right? When we get in a crisis mode, we we withdraw, we hide. And then when he does get called out, the first thing he says is, That woman you gave me. That woman you gave me. And he plays the blame game. Esau, in Genesis 27, he loses his his birthright, and then he loses the blessing from his father. How does he lose the birthright? He sells it for a pot of stew. How does he lose the blessing? Jacob steals it by deceiving their father. And so then, when Esau finally finds out that he's not only lost his birthright that he sold, but also his blessing that was stolen from him, he gets angry, so angry that later on, Jacob thought that he was basically going to get killed by his brother, and so he put all the, he put, put all the servants up front, so they'd take the brunt of it and put his family in the back, right? So maybe they'd survive. That's how angry Esau got. But the other thing that Esau does is, is he looks at his father and he says, my brother stole my blessing. And my brother stole my birthright. His brother didn't steal his birthright. He sold it. And so what do men do in crisis? They start blaming other people. And worse than that, we start lying about whose responsibility it is. Well, it's not my fault I lost my job. I mean, it's it's that lousy boss of mine. or it's that lousy. those, Those people had it in for me the whole time. And so we shirk responsibility for at least our part in the current crisis that we're in. Naaman. Naaman was a general in Elisha's time. Very powerful general. Very well known. He also had leprosy. And he heard about this prophet named Elisha in the nation of Israel that could heal him. And so this big general goes to talk to this sort of dirty prophet, you know, poor cleric that lives out in the desert. And before he gets there, Elisha sends a servant out, a messenger out that says, oh, if you want to be healed of leprosy, just go wash on the river seven times. And Naaman's pride is injured. He's a general. Who is this guy? I think he is sending a messenger out to talk to me. And because he's lived his life in this crisis 
of being very, very successful and yet having this leprosy, this disease that nobody wants to get close to him, he flies off into a rage. He says, are you kidding me? I got cleaner rivers in my part of the country than this dirty river that this guy wants me to wash in. Forget him. And he stomps off in a rage. He has a sense of entitlement. And he, and he, he avoids, he neglects, or he's willing to neglect the very thing that could solve his problems because his pride has been hurt. And luckily, Naaman has a faithful servant that says, you know, if he told you to do, like, really, really hard things, you would have done them. But because he told you to do this easy thing, you don't want to do it? That doesn't make any sense. I'm thinking it must have been a pretty uh, confident servant that would talk to their general like that. You know, I'm thinking, you know, it's either he's going to like what you said or (laughs) off comes your head, you know, one or the other. And luckily, Naaman comes to his senses and washes in the river and is healed. Or what about Peter? Think about the greatest crisis in Peter's life. They're in the garden. He's been following this rabbi who he loves fiercely. And another friend betrays his teacher. And the, and the soldiers come. And Peter says, i got to be in control. I'm going to make sure that these things happen. This wasn't the first time that Peter took this stance. Apparently, he didn't understand when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, that that wasn't the right way to think. Didn't sink in. And so now we're in the garden. You know, when when Peter said, nobody's going to hurt you. And Jesus said, well, you know, shut up. I have to be hurt. Then they're in the garden. The soldiers come. What's Peter do? Grabs a sword and starts swinging. He reacts with violence. And you see men, when they get in a crisis situation, react at the most extreme with violence. But the underlying issue is is that they think, I've got to be in control. I've got to control this situation. And so some guys become this hyper-controlling, their hyper-controlling temperament comes out when they're in a crisis situation. And we see this in guys today. Well, you know, why does crisis happen then? I mean, if this is how we react to it, my goodness, why? Why would a crisis happen? Now, let me let me quickly take a little side road here. There's a difference between crisis and suffering. There's a difference between crisis and suffering. Suffering is is a burden that you carry that light, because we live in a fallen world, because life doesn't work the way that we want it to work on this side of heaven. And so sometimes we live with things in our lives that are that things that are, cause us suffering. A suffering, is, suffering is not a crisis. Suffering, the Bible says, creates character. Suffering leads to character. Crisis tests your character. And so, and so don't, don't, don't think that, you know, a job loss. A job loss, that's not suffering. That's a crisis. That's an event that happens in your life that you've got to deal with. God calls us to follow him during a crisis, but God uses suffering in a different way. And so if you're here and you're, you know, uh, you're, you're, you've got some medical, ongoing medical thing that you just can't shake, or you've got, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've known guys that had, for instance, mentally ill wives, you know, that's, that's suffering. That's not a crisis. And that's going to be important when we talk about why crisis happens, because there's, there's really two reasons that I see the crisis happens. And let's look at Hebrews 12 to see both of these things. So if you've got your scriptures, turn to Hebrews 12. And I'm going to read two passages. We're going to look at two passages. We're going to look at verses 7 through 11. And we're going to look at verses 25 through 29 quickly here. Verse 7, endure hardship as discipline. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while 
as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So the first lesson here, the first reason that crisis happens is that that crisis happens, hardship happens as discipline. This is God disciplining us. And he uses the analogy of a father. Now, I think one of the reasons that we don't that we get angry with God sometimes when we're in a, in a crisis situation is that some of us were not well fathered. And so we don't really get the fact that, that sometimes dads do things to us that are painful, but they are totally motivated by love. So if a, if a child, to use Pat's illustration, if a three-year-old child is that doesn't know how to swim, goes to the beach for the first time and sees the water and looks, sees the, the waves crashing and it's gorgeous, it's beautiful, and they're just drawn to it and they run with all their might towards the water, but the father knows that there's an undertow. The father knows that the kid's this tall and four steps in, the water's this tall. What does the father do? Oh, Johnny, don't run into the water. No, what does the father do? The father takes off after him and grabs him and keeps him from running into the water. The child does not experience this as a positive experience. So sometimes God disciplines us as sons. The kind of discipline that is totally motivated by love. Totally motivated by love. The second reason is, let's look at uh, Hebrews, uh, let's go down to 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let's be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for, and he's quoting Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 4 here, for our God is a consuming fire. And so why does crisis happen? Because sometimes God needs to take the shakable things away from us because we're relying on them and they will not protect us. They're not, they're not true things. They're created things. If your stock portfolio is the thing that you're relying on for security in your life, that is a shakable thing. Now we really know that, right? If your 401k was what you were relying on for safety and security, well, the sands are shifting. Right? And so we see that part of the reason that crisis happens is because God removes these created things that we rely on so that we'll rely on Him. So we endure hardship as discipline. And what do we get out of that? Go back to this first passage again. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, it produces, listen to this, a harvest of righteousness and peace. A harvest of righteousness and peace. In other words, when, when God disciplines us, we learn how to act better. We learn how to live a better life, be the kind of men we want to be, and we find peace. Now, I don't know about you, but peace is in short supply right now. And so God's discipline brings righteousness and peace. What else does it do? Well, why does he remove created things from us? So that we can have a relationship with him. Because if your stock portfolio is not secure, what is? Well, your relationship with God is secure. He's the sovereign, holy, awesome God of the universe who made everything, who defines everything. What do you want to, you want to rely on some, some corporate CEOs and management teams who are trying to maximize profit for the shareholder? Yeah. I want to rely on God. And so when God removes the shakable kingdom... He brings us into a better relationship with us and he gives us security. And then listen to this. Remember, God is a consuming fire. He will burn up anything that comes between you and him. You realize, don't you, all of you that lost money, anybody who lost money in 2000 on the tech market burst. All right. It's my fault. 
God burned up the entire tech market because it was becoming, my company was becoming between me and him, and I didn't get the message the first two or three times that he told me, and he said, all right, you asked for it. And that's how much God loves me, and that's how much God loves you, that he will do anything to get you back into right relationship with him. And let me tell you, you know, you know the old, what is it, the old Amco commercials, you can pay me now or you can pay me later? Well, guys, you can, you can remove the shakable things from your life, or you can let God remove the shakable things from your life. When God does it, it's with a consuming fire. This Deuteronomy passage that he's referring to, this consuming fire, comes from God telling the nation of Israel, you better get rid of the idols. If you don't get rid of them, I'll get rid of them. What are the idols in your life? Is your 401k your idol? Is your family your idol? Is your health your idol? Are these things, what's an idol? It's just anything that you're relying on to make you happy instead of God making you happy. It's anything that you're giving your allegiance to instead of giving your allegiance to God. And God says, I will burn those things up. Well, how then should we respond to a crisis? Well, the first thing that we need to do, and we we find this in the first passage, is that we need to trust God. We need to trust God. If you're in a crisis, look, what's happening when you're in a crisis? You're losing all the things that you used to trust. So trust God. When you really trust God as a father who loves you, then you're able to submit to him. You know, guys, we don't like the submission thing, right? You're getting cage matches. What's a submission about? It's about, you know, it's tapping out. It's saying I'm weak. Well, guess what? Sorry, you're weak. You're a lightweight in a heavyweight division. God is bigger. And he's a jealous, loving God. But if you can trust him, if you can really trust him, well, then submission is easy. Just like you want your children to trust you, and when they trust you, then they submit to your will. When they trust you, they believe you when you say, don't touch the stove when when it's hot because it's going to burn you. They believe you when you look at your daughter and say, that guy is not good for you. He's, only, he's not out for your best interest. He's out for his best interest. You're gonna, this, is what, this is the relationship that we want to have with God. And then the other, the other, so that's in that first set of verses. And then in the, in the last set of verses, we see this. That, that because God is mo- removing the, unsha- the shakable kingdom and giving us an unshakable kingdom, that out of an attitude of gratitude out of a place of gratitude, then we can worship him. God doesn't want you to just worship him so we can feel better about himself. All worship is, is a, is a proper recognition of who God is. That's all worship is. And so if, you, if you, we can be grateful in the midst of crisis, if we can say, okay, Lord, I trust you. I submit to your will. This thing stinks It's painful. I hate it. But I'm really grateful that you are burning away the things in my life that aren't good for me. That you are burning away the things in my life that are coming between me and you. And because I trust you and because I'm grateful for that, now, now I have a proper relationship with God. Now I can speak reality when I talk about God. And the reality when we talk about God, the reality is an attitude of worship. There's a... The director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra is a man named Benjamin Zander. To my knowledge, he's not a, not a believer. You can, if you have a pen, write down this website, poptech.com, P-O-P-T-E-C-H.com. You can go to poptech.com, and they have all these videos, and you can look for the video of Benjamin Zander. It's about a 30-minute video. He brings this 15-year-old cellist onto the stage, and he, he sits him in a chair... And he has him play this very difficult concerto on the cello, or section of it. And the kid plays it beautifully. And in one place, the kid makes a mistake. And you can see the look on the kid's face when he makes the mistake. But he just keeps going. And so Xander, after he's done, he looks at him and he's telling him what a great job he did. And he's in a workshop with like 150 people. The kid's incredibly intimidated, but he, but he soldiers on. And he said, now, now, son, you made a mistake halfway through. And the kid goes, yeah, I really did. And and he says, so when I could tell you made the mistake because of that, that, that you flinched. 
And he said, he looked, at the, he looked at him and he said, you know, when you make a mistake, I, want you to, I don't want you to flinch anymore. Here's what I want you to do. When you make a mistake, I want you to do this. How fascinating. Kid's like, what? The crowd's like, what? He says, look, when, when things like that happen in your life, in your music, they happen for a reason. There's a lesson to learn there. So when you make a mistake when you're playing a concerto, I don't want you to get upset with yourself. I want you to be excited. I want you to go, how fascinating. I wonder why that happened. I wonder what fingering I need to learn or bow technique I need to learn. Guys, when crisis happens in our lives, we can get all upset about it. We can flinch. We can fight it. We can get angry or feel entitled or withdraw or any of those things. But instead, I want to encourage you to do this. How fascinating. I wonder what God's doing. I wonder what lesson God is teaching me. I wonder what thing there is in my life that I really thought I needed. And God is telling me, I really don't need that. How liberating that can be. What freedom that can bring in my life. So that's the thought I want to leave with you this morning. Is that when crisis happens... Instead of withdrawing and getting angry or feeling entitled or lying or blaming, take a deep breath, throw up your arms, say, how fascinating. And worship a God who loves you so much that he will remove anything that becomes between you and him. Let's pray. Father, we... We want to follow you, but Lord, we, we get caught up in our own expectations. We get caught up in our own definitions of what we need to live. We get caught up, Lord, in our, in our worldly perspective. Father, we want your perspective. Lord, many men in here are going through crisis. Father, help us to see how fascinating these times can be. How they can really be an opportunity for you to show us your love. To draw us close to you. Lord, I pray that for each man in this room. In Jesus' name, amen.